Hi, this is Dean Webb and his microphone for networking-forums.com and tonight I want to look at load balancing. Now this is not something that you see in every introductory networking course, but you see it in almost every network. The reason is simple. Uh, we have very large amounts of data that have to go across networks and they have to be able to use multiple lines possibly to reach their destination or there's so much data coming into a particular server that we actually want it to go to multiple servers to handle that big load. Uh, consider a, a, a massive website like Amazon. Uh, there is not just a single server for Amazon.com that's handling every single transaction coming in. So they have one IP address, Amazon.com, and multiple servers behind that handling the constant transactions that are going on every day. Every one of those servers is essentially part of a load balancing scheme. So let's take a look at how that affects the network. Uh, the, the first thing we could look at would be load balancing in terms of redundant links. Uh, say, for example, I've got a corporation and we have a one gigabit connection to the internet. And you know, we want to make sure that it doesn't get overwhelmed, so I purchase a second gigabit link with another vendor. Uh, that way we have full redundancy. If one goes completely down, the other one is there. And let's say that I want to distribute my traffic over there so the, the links are not always idle. And I could use a load balancing device that when the traffic comes into it, it then makes a decision either randomly or with an algorithm. And the algorithm could be simple as I sent one packet here, I send the next packet there. I sent one packet there, so I send the next packet there. Just very simple. Or it could be a little more fudgy where it wants to favor one line over the other and we put the different costs in there. But essentially, we, we could tune it to where it, it does whatever we want, so that way both links are used, and the load is balanced across them. Uh, now, we could have it be where the load balancing happens uh, from a server standpoint, as I mentioned earlier with Amazon, where we've got that single IP listed in DNS that says uh, you want to hit you know a certain website, you go to that IP address, when you but you're actually not hitting that website you're hitting the load balancer that says ah you've got traffic coming in for some website.com I will then distribute it to all these different servers in my back end and just keep going over and over following my algorithm and making sure they all get the information they have coming now the benefit with that is that if an attacker is trying to reach one of those servers to run evil code the load balancer actually intercepts it and looks at it and tries to parse the URL and if it can't parse it properly it'll just drop it and the attack never goes through. Handy thing there. Kind of security by accident. But it's security so I'll take it. I'll take it. Now another thing that could happen with this is if you have to have a session with the database that is persistent. In other words I've sent instructions to the server to give me some answers and based on those answers we're going to have some more activities. If I reach say server A over here and handle you know for the first part of my transaction and then the second part of my transaction goes to server B over here server B is going like what? What are you asking about? I don't have that information. And server A meanwhile has this information ready to go going well when's he going to ask the next question? I'm waiting. And so if you require persistence, then load balancing can be a problem. So a modern load balancing scheme would need to be able to build into it either a means by which a client can specify persistence or being able to recognize certain clients based on their IP address of origin or user or some other criteria need to have a persistent session. That means once they come in, identify that and keep it and don't spread it out. Just keep it on that one thing. And maybe what it'll do is it'll spread persistent sessions across that back end. So once you're assigned, you stay there, but you don't go anywhere else. Of course, you know, from a networking perspective, we're, we're all trying to reach that one IP address. And if the load balancer is having a problem and can't distribute the traffic evenly, or it's missing certain hosts, uh, 
troubleshooting that becomes one where we could always essentially reach that destination IP address, but it's the load balancer and we're not able to go beyond it to reach a specific host. So troubleshooting these scenarios in a network typically involves bypassing the load balancer, either taking a particular IP address on the network that we're going to use for the troubleshooting and saying, when that traffic hits your load balancer, don't balance it out. Just let it go through as normal. And then try to hit each IP address of a, of a backend server until you find the one that's down or you find out that multiple are down or whatever. But the, the traffic has to bypass the load balancer. Or sometimes it's the load balancer itself that's just dropping traffic and messing it up. And the solution would be you have to repair the load balancer. Uh, and you find this out, again, by bypassing that load balancer. Now, some load balancers don't handle the network traffic. They just handle giving directions. So think of it this way. What if somebody wanted to go shopping for groceries at a particular grocery store chain? And you're in charge of making sure that this grocery chain is never overwhelmed with too many customers. So the people always ask you, where do I go to get this? To, to, or they're asking, you know, where's the nearest grocery store? And you just lie and say, well, that one over there. And then the next person you say, that one over there is the closest. Just trust me on this. And they go there. And you're able to distribute the load that way. So what this is, uh, it could be something like what's called a round robin DNS. So the first time somebody asks for a particular website, the DNS will respond IP address A. And then the second time somebody asks for that address, the DNS says, okay, IP address B, go over there. Third time, IP address C. And fourth time, IP address D. And so forth. So it would be the load balance is not actually a network device. It's taking the traffic and deciding what to do with it. It's a DNS just giving out different results. And again, it can be set up to favor one over the other. There's also one that could be called uh, a geolocation sensitive load balancing arrangement to where it looks at the IP address of the incoming traffic and then based on information it has about where that address is, either using, if it's a public address, it can use public address information. If it's an internal RFC 1918 address, uh, for those of you who don't know, RFC 1918 says everything in the 10 range, uh, 172.16 to 172.31 XX and 192.168 XX are all ranges we can use internally without worry about being routed out on the internet. That's another topic there, but still an RFC 1918 address, you could have information within your round robin DNS to say, these IP addresses are at that location. You know, these IP addresses are Americas. These are European. And so when they come in, it can use a geo geolocation algorithm to say, ah, America's IP addresses will favor servers in the Americas. European ones will favor servers in Europe. And if all the Europe ones are down, well, then we'll send them to America. Or if all of America's down, we'll send them to Europe. Uh, Companies like to have situ uh, schemes in place to where if a, an entire data center goes down, the business keeps going. That's disaster resilience. We'll, I could talk about that again someday, or maybe I already have talked about it. Anyway, I'll talk about it some more later. Point being that this geosensitive one can favor certain areas based upon the origin IP address. So these don't really load balance. They really uh, load favor or low, they introduce a bias in the balancing. But again, if things are totally unavailable, they send the traffic elsewhere. This can be a problem if you have a persistent session with, say, the Europe server, and then for whatever reason, that server says it's not available. You know, it maybe it had, you know, something happened in its processor queue length and it just timed out on a packet or whatever. If you have a sensitive load balancing algorithm, it says, ah, He's down. Wait, no, he just missed one packet. Go over here. Ah, my persistent session. What happened? <laughs> I deals me out. No. And then you wind up with the Americas and that server says, I don't know about any persistent session. And you lose the transaction and the program quits. And ah, it's a problem until you bypass the load balancer. 
and then find out that the server was just overwhelmed for a moment and now it's all fine again. Um, I'll glance at the Wikipedia article for load balancers just to uh, check on my notes here. This is not cheating. This is using research here. So I have the, uh, oh yeah, the client side ones. You can have it set up to where the clients actually do their own load balancing when they have like a list of servers saying, try this one first, try this one second, or something of that nature. Or they use cookies. So that way, uh, the, pers the, the, the ability to handle persistence is actually done with the, uh, the, the cookie on your, on your client. So you come in with a session, the load balancer says, can I see your cookie, please? And goes, ah, you need to go to that computer there. And sets up that communication there. That's why whenever you clear cookies, sometimes weird things happen when you connect to a website. It's not the same experience you had before until you build back that cookie again. You can also have a uh, a load balancing done where uh, the load balancer actually acts to offload traffic. So, for example, the load balancer could be set up to uh, intercept traffic that, and, and then determine like this is an error, and then it'll handle the error message itself rather than passing it on to another web server for the web server to send an error onto you. It just says, look, I know it's an error 404. I'll give you an error 404 and not trouble the servers with their time. It could also act as a TLS D, uh, uh, D uh, whatever, I don't know, um, decryptor. That's it. Yeah. Looking for the word here. So what, what that means is you're connecting to a site via HTTPS and you hit the load balancer. The load balancer then says, all right, decrypt that and then send the rest of the traffic back to the server's HTTP. It's faster. We don't care about HTTP at this point because between the load balancer and the server, it's all on the same network. It's secure, ostensibly. So we don't need to worry about the encryption there. It's just the, the part going over the internet that we need to have encrypted. And there are special load balancers actually built with modules in them to do that traffic decryption and save the decrypting load off of the backend server. Interesting stuff there. Um, so what else we got here? Uh, they could do HTTP acceleration. They can uh, do delayed binding, so that way it uh, takes care of a sin flood attack. They could buffer packets. They could offload packets. Uh, they can do content filtering, almost like a proxy server there. They could do client authentication. Um, but basically, this is where they... These are like additional things you could do on a load balancer outside of the main purpose of it, which is to take traffic bound for a particular destination and distribute it among multiple servers that could handle that traffic or to take multiple paths to a destination and distribute the traffic across those paths. They'll all get to that destination, but we don't want to have any one path being overloaded by constant use. We want to use all of our paths. So that's the basic part of the load balancer, what it does, how to troubleshoot it, bypass the traffic and see if it works then. And after that, everything is up to the particular load balancer vendor that you're working with, read the manual, and of course, rely on tax support for really deep and in-depth stuff there. And if you want more deep and in-depth stuff, please come by to networking-forums.com where there's a lot of really smart people ready to give you a lot of really good answers. Until next time, I'm Dean Webb saying keep networking.